Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm so thrilled to be introducing our next keynote conversation, Stories of Objects, Museums, and Identity, which I know will prove to be a fascinating session interrogating how we remember, memorialize, and curate with integrity. Our panelists for this conversation are Nana Oforiada Yim, the founder of the Ano, Ano Institute of Arts and Knowledge, and a curator who has curated groundbreaking exhibitions, including Ghana's first exhibition at the Venice Biennale. We also have um, Professor Jeffrey Robertson, a celebrated human rights lawyer who has recently released a book titled Who Owns History? Um, Elgin's Loot and the Case for Returning Plundered Treasure. And we're super lucky today um, that this panel will be moderated by Professor Dan Hicks, who is a leading thinker exploring the study of colonial violence in museums and a curator of world archaeology at the Pitt Rivers Museum. So please join me in welcoming them. Right, OK, hello, everyone. Uh, wonderful to be here. Uh, we have an hour or so to talk about these, these issues, which slightly euphemistically may be on the program are described as the stories of objects. Here, I think, in this space, which is a space which is named the Milner Hall, and it's within Rhodes House, we have to start with something important, which is to remember where we're having this conversation, and how, as an institution, Rhodes House is, is experiencing the same moments as our museums are, which are how to deal with the legacies of empire, not as things which are part of the distant of the past, but are very much part of the present and a part of the world around us. And so the links in between the, uh, the finance here and the objects we're going to talk about are about histories of extraction. They are about histories of knowledge wrought from that extraction and how we can try to turn around these institutions in the present. So we're going to be talking really about you know, museums as you know, white infrastructure and how we, you know, what they're for in the present. So uh, Nana and um, uh, Nana, I think I'm going to ask to speak first and to introduce really Nana, how you've been thinking about issues over museums and heritage and objects in your recent in your recent work. I should mention that both of our speakers have a book out. Uh, Nana has you know, written her first uh, novel, which was out, I think, yesterday. And we'll be hearing more about the book of our other uh, conversation list in a moment. But uh, Nana, if I just wanted to, if I could hand over to you to, yeah, to, to start I, us off. I've got I think there are some images. Slides, yeah, yeah. So, um, shall I do the money now? Are we in the way? <laughs> While we're waiting for those, I think just underlining how much in the museum sector we've seen, you know, the world around us uh, changing is really important. So in museums, we often think about ourselves as keeping the w objects the same, but the world, of course, around us sort of changes. So a big part of the com context here is it, from a European side, the context of the Macron report last year, and then from an African perspective, actually really interesting, important new narratives emerging especially out of uh, West Africa, uh, but also across Africa as well. Um, and increasingly, I think, as we uh, develop, we're finding that the euphemisms which, which we're so used to using of contested histories, of difficult histories. Some of the histories we're going to hear about now are not difficult and, 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 and are not complex. They are things we need to face up to. Okay, great. Um, okay, so I'm just going to briefly go over um, what, how I've been working in the museum field over the last couple of years. So I have an institution in Ghana, which is called the Anno Institute of Arts and Knowledge, which is very much involved in institution building, cultural narrative building, archive building, and also human capital building in the arts um, sector. Um, OK. So I used to work at the British Museum um, a few years ago. This is an atom pum drum, which is a talking drum, which, as you can see here, is behind a glass case. 
Um, I'm going to go through these images quite quickly because I think I have about five minutes. Um, this is in my hometown, um, and um, Ghana is made up of a series of images uh, of kingdoms. My kingdom is called Achimabwakwa. In the palace, in the schoolhouse, we have varieties of objects. This drum, for example, I think is about 89 years old. It's an atom palm, it's a talking drum. It's brought out in festivals. It's the same drum that you have in the British Museum, kept in our own type of museum um, edifices. But as you can see, it's been left to wear and tear. And we have objects like this and also um, this is a batakari, which is a wall smock in a museum. This is, oh, okay. This is a batakari worn, actually worn by one of my cousins at a festival. So this batakari is also maybe about 60 years old. Um, and these objects and these items of clothing are passed down through time, but they are brought out um, in public what, what is called in English festivals, but is not really the correct translation. A fascia actually translates as the year ending. This is what a festival looks like. And this is, sorry, I'm, I'm not very good with this. Um, this is what a historical festival looks like. Actually, this is a contemporary one. Okay, this is what a historical festival looks like. So the, all these objects that you will find in museums, the drums, the kente cloth, poems, oral literature, etc., are all brought out once or twice a year in the festival. Um, now in Accra, with a group of artists, um, we've, we've kind of created a contemporary iteration of the festival to try and get the idea of art um, out of the museum and the white cube space onto the streets and take what is our historical version of the festival, but contemporize it. So the Chaliwati Festival happens once every year. Um, as I was thinking about how to democratize and make the, make the museum, I don't know what is happening, I'm sorry. As I was thinking about how to make the, um, the, the, the museum or the, the idea of, of art in a contained space more accessible, more equitable. Um, I, I thought of the kind of edifices that are um, accessible to the majority of people. Now we have these kiosks. Um, if you've ever been in West Africa, you'll have seen these kiosks on pretty much every street corner. They are for, um, you know, the mechanics, their hairdressers, their hotels, every single thing that you can think of is in a kiosk. So when I was thinking about what would I put a museum in that would make it accessible to the most amount of people, I thought of the museum and the kiosk. And so I started off by doing a kind of research exhibition in collaboration with artists to look at the actual structure of the kiosk which was this, and then set it up at the Charlie Water Festival, collecting objects, documents, photographs, etc., from the communities around the festival, which was also kind of inter interrogation into what objects do we give value to? Um, you know, why do we create some, sacralize some objects and why not others? And this is something that I kind of did in in collaboration with the community around, asking them which objects, which narratives are of value to them. Um, this is another key, uh, museum in a kiosk that we did the following year. Um, and then um, I decided that the, the, the museum is something that I wanted to take into communities around the country. And so we did this recce where we went around the country, around Ghana, all 10 regions, asking people, what is art, what is culture to you, what kind of structures would you like your art and culture to be represented in? Um, this is the methodology that we used in term, um, as we ask questions. I'm not going to go through it because it's going to take too long. Um, and this is what we've, we've ultimately come up with as a mobile museum structure. This is designed by a young architect, a brilliant young architect. She's called Latifa Idris. She's 25 years old. Um, I've been working with her since she was at university. This structure actually comes apart um, and you can put it on the back of a truck and we take it through the country. And what I love about this as well, she's actually woven her personal biography into the museum, which takes away also this idea of the objective, authoritative um, museum. 
Um, this, oh. Okay, this is, um, so we're, we're actually getting the mobile museum ready right now. We're taking it on the road early December. And so this is kind of what we are, um, what we're brainstorming in terms of what is actually gonna go into the museum in each region. In each region, we work with a contemporary artist, um, with objects and, and documents and photographs, and maps, et cetera, from the community. Um, we also, um, one of the things that we also wanted to do was not have art and culture as separate from everyday life. And so we also work with communities around the kinds of issues that are um, happening in their lives and then see how, how the, 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 con the concentrated space of arts and culture that we've created can be a, um, an intervention method into those. Um, and so finally, I'm going to wrap it up now. So finally, like how the mobile museum and what we find in it can be accessible, not just to communities that we're working in, but also to a wider audience. Um, I, in 2012, um, I, I had an exhibition um, as part of a group exhibition at the new museum. And um, it's quite a long story, but came up with this idea of having a pan-African culture encyclopedia um, with the idea of turning the notion of the encyclopedia on its head. Um, it was quite a long process, but we finally came to this organizational method, which was um, based on an indigenous knowledge system that we have in Ghana that's centuries and centuries old. I won't go into it because it will also take too long. Um, and the other kind of things that I've been doing with museums is looking into Western museums and how one can rethink the notion of Western museums. Here's the director of the British Museum. He came to my space last year, um, and we had workshops with people in Ghana about the idea of what a museum can look like, um, what it can entail, how collaborations can happen. This is some of the research that I've been doing at the Pitt Rivers Museum here in Oxford, um, specifically with the Ghanaian collection and, and Ratray, the anthropologist from 1920s. And then finally, oh, Okay, this is um, the exhibition that I did earlier this year in Venice, which was also kind of a prototype of what a museum in Ghana might look like outside of the white cube. And then finally, the, um, this is a um, 17th century castle in Ghana that we're in the process of turning into a museum, which is actually going to be quite a um, great prototype for the kinds of ideas that I've been working on. That was great. <laughs> So that was absolutely great introduction to reminding us of how the, Africa, the notion of the museum is being reinvented from Africa uh, and the intertwined nature of you know, European and African you know, museums in the present, how interventions can happen. We're going to move on now to a, another introduction to this, this book, really, which is only just out. As well, in fact, I, you know, I ordered it from Amazon and it arrived on uh, Thursday, so maybe a day before uh, Nana's book, uh, Jeffrey's, is out. But they're both out this week, Who Owns History? And really in the context of you know, the British Museum's director, who we just saw, saying that the taking of the Elgin marbles was a creative act, <laughs> and the more extreme position from the V&A, where Tristram Hunt has said that any, any conversation about restitution is a kind of iconoclasm. We can move to Geoffrey to hear a little bit more about how he's been thinking about the European context here. I've been thinking about theft. I've been thinking about loot. I've been thinking about the barbarism of the British Army in the 19th century as they went through, for example, the Summer Palace in China. Elgin's son, head of the British troops, Three days they looted this amazing place just outside Beijing uh, with the French. And then Elgin said, I'm going to burn it. And the French said, oh, that's really against our principles. <laughs> he said, no, it's not. And he burnt it with 150 eunuchs and servants consumed uh, in the flames, the princess. And then there's Benin and there's Magdala. And there are all the barbarities of the 19th century taking the cultural treasure that had been stored evidence of 16th, even 15th century civilizations. Now, 
this, it seemed to me, is not on. I begin with the Parthenon marbles simply because that is the best known case. It wasn't uh, looting, it was the case of simple theft. Elgin had the money to offer to pay for them. He didn't because he knew the Ottomans would never allow it. They never allowed the stripping of temples. So instead, he paid vast sums in bribes to a couple of corrupt officials to turn a blind eye to the way his workmen stripped the temple. And my book is really an investigation of all the lies and half-truths that the British Museum has told and is still telling about Elgin's rescue, as they have it, of the half of the marbles. The frieze is an extraordinary, extraordinary sculpture of, I see it as a procession in favor or in celebration of democracy, 440 BC, the first democracy, a procession about peace, peace and uh, extraordinarily on a temple, not what is central, a human beings talking, walking, drinking, a lot of drinking, and uh, celebrating uh, the joys of living in peace in a democracy. And this is so important, it seems to me, to be together. The British Museum keeps its half in a dirty gray room called the Duveen Gallery named after Sir Joseph Duveen, a crook, an art fraudsman, who made enough money out of his art frauds to bribe sufficient people and to uh, miscarry the marbles by cleaning them, scouring them, making them white, which they never were. So I'm keen to, and, and of course, the British Museum have consistently improved on its lies. They put up a new lie at the entrance to the gallery uh, just two years ago, saying that it, Elgin was uh, given permission by a named person who was the senior Turkish official in Athens. I had to run that down. He wasn't in Athens at all. He was in a dog's body in Constantinople who had no right uh, to give permission of any sort. So uh, part of my quest has been to see how British museums simply can't face the truth of colonial acquisition. And that is more obvious when you turn to the killing sprees and the looting sprees in which they got this material. The British Museum will never admit that a great British hero shot at an indigenous person. They always fire warning shots. There are hundreds of warning shots that they fire. Captain James Cook, for example, uh, there's a shield that was dropped by an Aboriginal on Botany Bay in the museum that says he fired warning shots. If you look at Cook's diary, he said, I fired one warning shot, and then when they didn't disperse, I fired at the man who dropped the shield. So that's just one example of how Museums, when dealing with colonialism, talk in euphemism, talk, uh, do not tell the truth. Another example, which I take from my friend, Tristan Hunt, whose museum, the V&A, decided to have an exhibition this year about Magdala. And the barbarity of the British army in Magdala was extraordinary. They attacked this kingdom in Ethiopia, which had a Christian king and had done no wrong. He'd taken a few hostages because the British wouldn't reply to his requests for help uh, against uh, his Muslim neighbors. And uh, it was a massive expedition, 200 donkeys and 40 elephants were taken to Ethiopia by Sir Garnet, by 
the British army to destroy this citadel of a Christian king, and more importantly, to loot it, to get all the gold. And they did. The king was found dead. He committed suicide with a revolver that Queen Victoria had given him. Uh, and his family, his citizens, were killed mercilessly. And the British Museum actually supplied an official to direct the looting. Because looting in these days of 19th century British Army was all part of a protocol. You went in, and the Ashanti were victims, as you know, in Ghana. And uh, you looted, and the booty was put up for sale to pay for the punishment expedition, which was really an expedition for land and for gold. And they brought this back. It was sold to the museums of the world. A lot ended up at the V&A. So this year, Tristram Hunt had an exhibition, 150 years since Magdala. It was something, because I was writing about it, I went off to Keen to see, because a lot of the loot had ended up at the v &A. And I couldn't see it anywhere when I got there. I went through the courtyard, the Sackler courtyard, went through to the Art and Education Center, the Sackler Art and Education Center. The v &A is just one big advertisement for O points, but uh, <laughs> which, which the Louvre has, won't have the <laughs> Metropolitan Museum in New York. We'll not have that we've even got a trustee, a Dame, Dame Teresa Sackler. Well, while she stays away from extradition, but she's uh, there at the V&A. And anyway, I found it eventually. It was upstairs, hidden in among the diamond collection. And there was the sacred crown, the golden crown of King Theodore, who's still revered as a semi-god in Ethiopia, uh, of anything we should give back. It's the sacred golden crown. And there are a few pictures of this expedition, but there was a notice. And this really made me think that British museums cannot tell the truth about colonialism. This is what it said. As is often the case with items of this nature, in museum collections, there are many questions surrounding their history and provenance. The 150th anniversary is an opportunity to reconsider the role of these objects as witnesses to a controversial period in Ethiopian and British history. This, this, have you ever heard such euphemism? This was a barbaric crime against humanity. <laughs> it's just a controversial period in British and Ethiopian history. And it still is because they still refuse to return the crown. And indeed, the British Museum have some Talbots, uh, which are sacred religious items from Ethiopia that they lock up in a room. They don't allow their own staff to see them. And when an Ethiopian churchman comes to gain access, they allow them, but of course they will not return them to Ethiopia. Now this is uh, partly due to a colonial finders keepers rule against deaccession. Uh, the French have it, uh, the non-alienation laws. And if there is anything that must be changed, it is the law that disallows museum trustees to de-access, to give back material, cultural property that was stolen in the most bloodthirsty way by the British and, of course, by the French and German armies in the 19th century. Back they must go. And it, you know, you get politicians making empty words of uh, regret over colonialism, but uh, they don't take the matter any further. What we must have is a law or at least a practice that requires, as the Saar Savoy report says, uh, a return of 
stolen cultural property. I, in my book, outline ways this can be achieved. Firstly, by going to the International Court of Justice on behalf of the Parthenon marbles, which are perhaps the best known case. And uh, we believe, I did a, uh, I've been helped by Amal Clooney and the late Professor um, Norman Palmer. Uh, we believe that international law has now got to the stage where we can say that there's a rule that wrongfully taken cultural property must be returned. And, and that rule can come from the International Court of Justice. In the meantime, there are other ways. Every museum now has a rule, thanks to the Museum Association, which says uh, requests for restitution must be dealt with quickly and considerately. Fine, but how? What is the basis upon which you decide whether to restitute or not? And so in my book, I've tried to isolate those cases. Uh, the, 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 the Parthenon marbles go back. The Rosetta Stone, however, doesn't go back for various reasons, partly because it's a boring tax dodge for priests, as, as <laughs> there are a lot of those. There are 17 copies of the Rosetta Stone, and the magic of the Rosetta Stone was done in the British Museum by a French and, and British scientists. So uh, those are the kind of distinctions. Benin bronzes, of course, go back. The Koh-i-Noor diamond, I mean, it's hilarious. You can go, I don't know whether you've been to the tower, to the uh, Royal Jewels. You, you get on an escalator and you pass the crowns and the Koh-i-Noor diamond, which was taken from a 10-year-old Maharaja by the East India Company, who was then schooled in the most outrageous way. His mother was put in prison. He was schooled to present it in a farcical episode to Queen Victoria, who could then wear it in her crown. And as you pass it in the tower, you see a note saying, uh, this jewel is only in women's crowns because it is believed to be bad luck to be worn by a man. And this jewel was <laughs> worn on the arm of all the great uh, Mughal emperors as they, uh, for luck, as they eviscerated their opponents. So that's, uh, I guess it would be worn in Queen Camilla's crown and we might at the next coronation and we might uh, see it returned to <laughs> India as uh, after, after Brexit, in an, effort, in an effort to drum up trade. But this is the sort of nonsense that, that you get. So I think that we need to start moving restitution onto a legal basis. We need that law enunciated by the International Court of Justice. We need these distinctions made. I mean, we don't want everything back. We're not another amphora school of uh, restitution is not something that uh, I would support. But there are grounds for making distinctions, for developing rules of ethics and rules of law requiring stolen articles to go back. The law, in law, thieves are regarded as trustees of it. It doesn't matter how long they keep them or how much they improve them. They have to go back. And, uh, I believe, and I've set out in this book, the reasons why stolen cultural property should be returned so long as it can be preserved. There are lots of museums where um, they're not, uh, they don't have air conditioning and the articles deteriorate. There are some museums which are in control of the government and can be used for propaganda. So there are distinctions. There are important uh, considerations to weigh against it. But there is no doubt, there's a very important Ghanaian object, a gold, the biggest mm. piece of golden jewelry that um, was taken during the Ashanti Wars, which were terrible colonial uh, battles in the Gold Coast by the British Army. And a lot of them were bought by a man called Wallace, whose collection is now 
in the Wallace Museum. And this Ashanti gold is meant to be there. Have you been to the Wallace? No, I haven't. I, I went in researching this book just to find the Ashanti gold. I couldn't find it anywhere. There were no signs, there was no, I went to every room. And uh, finally, I found a West African woman who was one of the guards. And I said, where is the Ashanti gold? Her eyes lit up and she directed me exactly to where it was hidden. It's hidden in the Oriental Armaments Room. Can you imagine your, your sacred gold hidden behind Oriental Armaments? And uh, I said, I hope we can get it back. And she looked at me joyously. She said, that would be wonderful. So at least there are some audience. But what struck me, I did some investigation. And back in 1964, the curator said, we've got all this Ashanti gold. Um, we've got nowhere to put it. Perhaps we could hide it in the Oriental Armaments Room. And that is where it is today, hidden. And the Wallace Collection will not give it back. That's what you should have on your traveling exhibition. Okay, so well, the Ashanti <laughs> should have it back. Yeah. The King of the Ashanti, he's asked for it. So. But, but they will not give it back, and, and that is what we have to now work to force them to do. That's right. So we're, we've, yeah, we've been moving around there in a, in a wonderful uh, way, horrific way in many ways, in between these different museums and these different acts of you know, violence, whether it is the Ashanti um, raid or war in 1892, whether it is the looting of the East India Company in India in the 1850s, whether it is the, the, the Nigerian attack um, in the late 1890s, uh, a number of examples <clears throat> that you gave, all of which I should say are reflected in the collections of the University of Oxford as, as well, in the, uh, the Pitt Rivers uh, Museum. Um, and of course, with our display of Ethiopian uh, texts uh, at the Western Library just, just yeah, last year, actually, as compared with the V&A, actually no mention of uh, Magdala was, was made in that exhibit. And that leads me into the next question, really, which is about knowledge. So these museums, to some degree, these objects that we're talking about are archives, but you know, what are they archives of? Uh, so it's a question initially for, for, for Nana, really. You know, when we're thinking about knowledge, this can tell us about indigenous knowledge, it can tell us about you know, religious knowledge or knowledge of power, sovereignty, Anthropologists you know, like to think of these objects as holding ethnographic knowledge. There's also maybe forms of memory. Of all of, the, all of those, or maybe more options of knowledge, here we are in a, in a space of learning and of knowledge. How do, you, how do we address the knowledge or the archival nature of these objects, or, or indeed of the museum as a whole, as we try to reconnect them with the sort of museum practices you know, which are able to happen in the present? Um, well, I have to say, first of all, that my concern, first and foremost, is, what, is what's in happening in Ghana and on the African continent more than what's happening in the West. Of course, it happens in the dialectic, but that's where I'm centered. Um, so a lot of, actually, even the conversations that were happening yesterday about the decolonization of, of knowledge, I think, are more Western concerns than they are ones that we're concerned with on the ground. Um, so, and also, the other thing that I'm more concerned with is what are our ways of historicization and of archiving that were in a sense um, smothered by the colonial encounter and to what extent are they heuristic and useful for how we look at how to archive and historicize our knowledge um, and then how can that happen in dialogue with what's happening in the west and so to a certain extent, I am concerned with what's happening in Western museums and museology, but I'm much more concerned with what's happening with us and how that can work in dialogue and in concert with what's happening here. Um, in terms of how, how things are archived, I mean, obviously it's problematic. I worked at the British Museum for a long time. There's huge gaps in terms of how objects from my country um, or from my kingdom are presented. Um, it's very one-dimensional. It's very flattening. Um, I know that the Pitt Rivers, for example, has been doing quite active work in getting so-called. I mean, 
I feel like all the language and all the dialectic around what's happening even to this day is problematic okay. when they bring in so-called indigenous experts. Um, you know, the word indigenous is, is problematic in itself. Um, you know, and we're, f we're kind of flown into museums to give our opinion on what should happen and then flown out again. I, I don't think that, I think there needs to be a more concerted, more <laughs> equitable um, a a approach. Um, you know, I'm, to be honest, I'm also getting a little bit, I think we've had this conversation, I'm getting a little bit fed up of being flown in as a kind of resident expert on African objects in museums to give kind of, you know, what I think should be done on it and then stepping out again. So I think even, I know that there's this huge push right now towards the decolonization of museums, um, but it needs to happen in a different way than it's happening now. That's right. No, it's a whitewash in some cases, isn't it? Mm. And it's, a, it's, a, it's sort of tokenism. You're absolutely, I couldn't agree more. Maybe the first thing to do is to decolonize the appointment of trustees. Uh, government always says, no, we don't have any. It's all the trustees. For... Has anyone looked at the trustees, for example, of the British Museum who make these decisions? Who appoints them? Where do they come from? I did a little analysis of the, of the trustees of the British Museum. And there are 25 of them. And uh, they're appointed basically by the department, by the prime minister, but the Department of Digital Culture, Media and Sport. You go on its website and it says it tr appoints trustees on merit. Well, what sort of merit, I wonder? Well, the most conspicuous merit in 20 of the current 25 trustees is the merit of making large sums of money for themselves and their multinational companies. The trustees are directors and partners of McKinsey, has two trustees, Merrill Lynch, Bloom, Glaxo, Smith Klein, BlackRock, the world's biggest investor in fossil fuels, has two trustees, Salomon Brothers, Goldman Sachs, John Lewis, J Jardine Matheson, of course, has a trustee, the opium pushers of China during the Opium Wars, Chubb, the world's largest property insurer, Goldfields, De Beers, in, and in various capacities, the Confederation of British Industry. Now, they're estimable people, of course, but how come, how unrepresentative are these multi-millionaires and their multi-billion companies of the 80,000 people who are friends of the British Museum? They should be the ones to elect the trustees, not uh, a government appointment which is based on the amount of wealth the applicant has. So I think at a time when we have uh, trustees making these decisions about Sackler money, about BP sponsorship, about a whole host of moral issues. The first thing to do is to uncouple the, guy, the, the trusteeship of the museum uh, with wealth and, and uh, high finance. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the, the relationship, of course, in between extractive colonialism and corporate colonialism yes. in the 19th century and, and oil, for example, mm. is, you know, direct. It is direct. Um, so it isn't, you know, not for nothing are these, are these, are these links made. Mm. Um, I just want very swiftly, I'm being asked to move on to opening this up, which I think would be absolutely great. Let's just, before we do that, though, um, hear a little bit more just on the points that were being made over the decolonization agenda. Um, you know, what does that mean? Is that term a useful term in this context, the decolonization of museums? Is it, I mean, there are, I remember a conversation in this institution around how, how, how what we teach in, in, in history might be um, opened up and you know, decolonized. 
And there, a lot of those conversations, it seemed to me, were, were about the idea of world history, that the idea that we just expand the remit and we teach Indian history or African history in a way that we haven't done before or expand to every part of the world, rather than necessarily you know, what, you know, what others might argue, which, which is to decolonize other ele elements of thought, or indeed that the decolonization term is unhelpful. I mean, where do you stand? You've hinted at it already, Nana, but I mean, where do you stand on this you know, vocabulary which we hear, which, which I mean, you were implying is maybe a Western vocabulary? What ought we, be, ought we to be talking about the decolonization of museums? Well, again, I, I have to have this proviso that I'm working not f in, a, in, yep. in a Ghanaian and West African context, and in that context, yep. No, decolonization is not useful. I mean, the colonial, all that it does is it centers the colonial encounter as the, the most important encounter in our historical trajectory, which it's not. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's an important chapter, but it's a relatively brief chapter in our history. Um, and the idea of that everything that comes now is post-colonial or part of the decolonization pr um, pract um, process is, it's, it's wrong, it's, it's erroneous, it, it's, it centers something that was, you know, in a way, in many ways, a traumatizing experience into the center of our history. So, I mean, what's exciting, what's exciting about working um, in Ghana in the context that I'm working in now is that we're literally in the process of creating new movements, new definitions, um, new ways of seeing. We don't quite have the terminology for it yet, but it feels like an exciting moment, and it doesn't feel like a post-colonial moment. We're not reacting to the colonial in any way. We're creating new languages, new terminologies, new term definitions. But if, you know, if it was up to me, I would leave the, the terms of decolonial and post-colonial behind. I understand that they're useful in a Western context because it's you know, still very much dealing and hasn't dealt with a lot of its colonial legacy. <laughs> Um, but from where I stand from it, no, it's not a useful term. I don't talk about it <coughs> at all. My language is justice. I think it's an issue of justice, not decolonization. I take my cue from Cicero, who in his indictment of Gaius Verres, the corrupt Roman governor of Sicily, depicted the Sicilians coming and weeping and grieving as they saw their stolen cultural property uh, displayed in the Roman Forum, which was a kind of open-air British Museum. And uh, it is basically a question of justice. This, these peoples, Africa, Asia, China in particular, have had their culture looted, stolen. And it's time, because culture is in a sense eternal, that it was returned. It's a far more simple concept than uh, colonization. Absolutely. And of course, let's uh, remember from the UK perspective that the law has changed on the, the, the restitution of human remains. Mm. It has changed for spoliation Jewish, holocaust. Uh, art. And yeah. spoliation empire is in many ways the next set of an ongoing step. set of conversations. Let's open it up. There's so much we could ask about. We've heard about um, you know, reinventing the museum in West Africa, we've heard about returning objects from the West and the, the, uh, the lies or the, the new lies which can be told you know, by museums. On any of those or, or other topics, would anyone, and I'd, I'd ask you for the, as we're recording this, to um, uh, let us know your name as you um, ask the question, but can, has anyone got a question for our two incredible conversation lists? Yeah. I, I had a question. You, you mentioned as you were developing the idea to move the museum from place to place within Ghana, that you were having conversations about how people interacted with what art and culture means to them from region to region. Um, and I was just curious sort of what, what those conversations were like and sort of like what variations you saw from region to region. Um, just what your thoughts are on that in terms of when you're tailoring sort of a museum and its display of, of, of objects for people, how um, the, the like, locality of that can change. How it can change what? 
Oh, I'm Clara, sorry. <laughs> but how it can change what, sorry? Um, the, the, the variation and those conversations that you have about what, how people are relating to art and culture, just sort of, um, you mentioned that you went to like 10 different um, regions within Ghana that you were having these sort of conversations with people about how they would define art and culture and what they'd be interested in seeing. I was just curious, um, you know, what, what variations that you saw, because it's interesting to think about um, sort of tailoring um, artistic experiences um, on a more local level. Yeah, I mean, I think this was something that was very important to me from the beginning is to not have a top-down approach, to not have a group of us in a room brainstorming about what kind of museum should we create, but actually literally go into the country and ask as many different people as possible, what do you actually want? You know, we, we, can, we can create as many museums and large-scale structures as we want, but are those going to be ones that speak to people, you know, the majority of people on the street? So that this is what, yeah, this is what we did and this is what we asked. And I learned a lot in the process and I'm still learning a lot. Um, you know, first of all, the terminology that we use in Ghana around arts and culture, I used the word a memory, um, which kind of is, is wide, is a wide term, uh, term for, for culture. And even that I learned as I went on the road that it needs to be broken down into many, many different concepts of creation and creativity. Um, also, you know, what kind of structures did we have before and do people still have in which they engage with culture and art and that actually, you know, gets them to, to engage with it? Um, you know, what what is important to people? Are, are museums important to people? Is it important to them to have art and culture in a concentrated space in which they can enter into? All these things are things that I'm learning about and hopefully what we create um, in the aftermath or in the process of this is something that will actually be applicable to our context and then might be something that will be exportable in some way, will be something that people here, for example, can learn from because it's something that we've asked people about. And I think that's a gap that we have here in museums here as well, which is, are you, are you asking people what they want or are you just creating these kind of monolithic authoritative structures that you think are right for people? So yeah, it's very much, it's a process that I'm still very much learning from. Right, okay, thank you. So I've, uh, we've had an indication that we've got another f five minutes. I'm gonna take two short questions, uh, and then I will offer the, each of the conversationalists to, in a sentence or two, just as we you sum up your, your takeaway message. But there's a question here. Uh, thank you. Um, Jim McCluskey from the University of Melbourne, Australia. I wonder if um, uh, Jeffrey and Nana could comment on how the principles you shared with us might apply to the return of human remains, um, particularly important in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island culture. And mm. one of the challenges that we're recognising is very often the communities to whom those remains might be returned don't have the infrastructure or the cultural history to quite know what to do with them. Do you want to ask the, the, the other? So what, what might be the role of museums? What, what mechanisms might there well, be to repatriate in a meaningful way? Yeah, I got a call from Michael Mansell, who was an Aboriginal, Tasmanian Aboriginal activist, one weekend, and he said, can you stop the Natural History Museum experimenting on the, the bodies, the remains of my ancestors? Uh, the Natural History Museum had a lot of Aboriginal skulls and bones robbed from graves, killed in what was in effect a genocide in 1830 Tasmania. They had um, used to prop up Victorian mantelpieces and they decided to um, do some experiments on them. And uh, this was disruptive to the spiritual beliefs of the survivors or ancestors of the survivors, so we went into court. And uh, we got an injunction on the Sunday. They were due to start testing on the Monday. On the Monday, they stormed into court, outraged, 
that we were trying to interfere with their possessions. Of, uh, and, and they said, we're just going to cut them around a bit, the council said. And I said, well, they're, they're experimenting on the victims of genocide. And it was that phrase, I think, that uh, caused the donors to the museum to have a great deal of trouble with what the museum planned. So we had a mediation, wonderful. Uh, two mediators, the Chief Justice of England, Chief Justice of New South Wales, and in the result, the, the scientists changed their views and they accepted that they had tried to experiment without the consent of the community, that they were wrong, and they returned the remains and even the uh, parts that had been prepared for dissection. So I think that, is, that was 2008. And since then, we've seen, I think this week, Manchester is returning a lot of uh, human remains. Germany has, led, has returned to Aboriginal communities in Namibia, in Australia. So I think, and of course, in America, they have the Indian uh, mm -hmm. Act, which requires re return of all human remains of Indians that were taken uh, during the periods of aggression. So I think there are now, in relation to human remains, sufficient to actually get back human remains. The test will be the Humboldt Museum when it opens in Berlin, which still has quite a few of the, uh, from the old Tanganyika. But uh, I do think that human remains at least can now, by law, be repatriated. Can I just say something briefly? I, um, I can't stand this argument that people use about oh, if we return their objects, then will they be able to look after them? I mean, it's the most patronizing statement I think I've ever heard. You can't come into my house, steal my things, and then tell me you can't give them back to me because I don't know how to look after them. I think it's, yeah. It's, it's horribly patronizing. So I think, yeah, when that debate or well, that argument comes up, I. It, bristle so much. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't even know. For me, that's, that's, that's still colonial violation. Yeah. Right. I think we're almost out of time, but I am going to ask you both, you know, just really for a takeaway message out of all these, we've, we've talked about remembrance to some degree and knowledge. We've talked about the repurposing of museums or reimagining you know, museums. We've talked about the dismantling of some of the infrastructure, of the white infrastructure of, of, of the remnants of empire. And I think informing that has been a sense that, you know, these aren't sort of relics from the past. These are on, ongoing situations, ongoing relationships. But, I mean, what's your takeaway message? Maybe if, if we go to you first, uh, Geoffrey, what's your, in a, in a sentence or two? Well, I think we're at the beginning of the period where restitution is seen as acceptable. We have a whole <laughs> barrage of rhetoric from Neil McGregor, from James Cuno at the Getty, that says, and they actually wrote a document to this effect, that museums should judge the ethics of their acquisitions by the ethics of the time at which they were acquired, which is to go back a century. Um, McGregor says, oh, we're presenting the ancient world to the modern world. But in fact, the modern world has rules about what should be presented and where, and they're based on human rights and on justice. And that is the, uh, those dimensions have to be considered. And restitution claims have to be taken seriously according to those rules. Thank you. Nana. Um, I mean, I think museums are kind of microcosm for, for much larger debates. And I think it's an interesting time. It'll be interesting to see what happens in the next five to 10 years. Um, I mean, I think we're still at a quite problematic time in terms of the language, in terms of um, still things being very much centered in the West around this 
debate and dialogue. And I think when it will start to get interesting and is when there is really an equitable, equal dialogue between different places and when there's honesty as well, when there's honesty and transparency. So let's see if that happens sooner. Absolutely. Okay, um, thank you. Well, that's a good note to end on. I just want to remind people that um, in all good bookshops, you're able to get hold of yeah, both uh, your new novel, which is called The Godchild, uh, and, and also Who Owns History is out also in all uh, uh, reputable book, uh, bookstores. <laughs> it simply remains for us to, you know, to thank our conversationalists for the past wonderful hour. Thank you.